Chapter Four of Two Poets by Honoré de Balzac, translated by Ellen Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Perry. Chapter Four. Monsieur de Bargeton was the great grandson of an alderman of Bordeaux named Miro, ennobled under Louis the Thirteenth for long tenure of office. His son, bearing the name of Miro de Bargeton became an officer in the household troops of louis the fourteenth and married so great a fortune that in the reign of louis the fifteenth his son dropped the miro and was called simply monsieur de bargeton this monsieur de bargeton the alderman's grandson lived up to his quality so strenuously that he ran through the family property and checked the course of its fortunes two of his brothers indeed great uncles of the present bargeton went into business again for which reason you will find the name of miro among bordeaux merchants to this day the lands of bargeton in angoumois in the barony of rochefoucauld being entailed and the house in angouleme called the hotel bargeton likewise the grandson of monsieur de bargeton the waster came in for these hereditaments though the year seventeen eighty nine deprived him of all seignorial rights save to the rents paid by his tenants which amounted to some ten thousand francs per annum if his grandsire had but walked in the ways of his illustrious progenitors bargeton the first and bargeton the second bargeton the fifth who may be dubbed bargeton the mute by way of distinction should by rights have been born to the title of marquis of bargeton he would have been connected with some great family or other and in due time he would have been a duke and a peer of france like many another whereas in eighteen hundred and five he thought himself uncommonly lucky when he married mademoiselle marie louise anais de negro police the daughter of a noble long relegated to the obscurity of his manor-house scion though he was of the younger branch of one of the oldest families in the south of france there had been a negro police among the hostages of saint louis the head of the elder branch however had borne the illustrious name of d'espard since the reign of henri iv when the negro police of that day married an heiress of the d'espard family as for monsieur de negro police the younger son of a younger son he lived upon his wife's property a small estate in the neighborhood of barbezieux farming the land to admiration selling his corn in the market himself and distilling his own brandy laughing at those who ridiculed him so long as he could pile up silver crowns and now and again round out his estate with another bit of land circumstances unusual enough in out-of-the-way places in the country had inspired madame de bargeton with a taste for music and reading during the revolution one abbe niolon the abbe rose's best pupil found a hiding-place in the old manor-house of escarbas and brought with him his baggage of musical compositions the old country gentleman's hospitality was handsomely repaid for the abbe undertook his daughter's education anais or nais as she was called must otherwise have been left to herself or worse still to some coarse-minded servant-maid the abbe was not only a musician he was well and widely read and knew both italian and german so mademoiselle de negro police received instruction in those tongues as well as in counterpoint he explained the great masterpieces of the french german and italian literatures and deciphered with her the music of the great composers finally as time hung heavy on his hands in the seclusion enforced by political storms he taught his pupil latin and greek and some smatterings of natural science a mother might have modified the effects of a man's education upon a young girl whose independent spirit had been fostered in the first place by a country life the abbe niolon an enthusiast and a poet possessed the artistic temperament in a peculiarly high degree a temperament compatible with many estimable qualities but prone to raise itself above bourgeois prejudices by the liberty of its judgments and breadth of view 
in society an intellect of this order wins pardon for its boldness by its depth and originality but in private life it would seem to do positive mischief by suggesting wanderings from the beaten track the abbe was by no means wanting in goodness of heart and his ideas were therefore the more contagious for this high-spirited girl in whom they were confirmed by a lonely life the abbe niolon's pupil learned to be fearless in criticism and ready in judgment it never occurred to her tutor that qualities so necessary in a man are disadvantages in a woman destined for the homely life of a house-mother and though the abbe constantly impressed it upon his pupil that it behoved her to be the more modest and gracious with the extent of her attainments mademoiselle de negropolice conceived an excellent opinion of herself and a robust contempt for ordinary humanity all those about her were her inferiors or persons who hastened to do her bidding till she grew to be as haughty as a great lady with none of the charming blandness and urbanity of a great lady the instincts of vanity were flattered by the pride that the poor abbe took in his pupil the pride of an author who sees himself in his work and for her misfortune she met no one with whom she could measure herself isolation is one of the greatest drawbacks of a country life we lose the habit of putting ourselves to any inconvenience for the sake of others when there is no one for whom to make the trifling sacrifices of personal effort required by dress and manner and everything in us shares in the change for the worse the form and the spirit deteriorate together with no social intercourse to compel self-repression mademoiselle de negropolice's bold ideas passed into her manner and the expression of her face there was a cavalier air about her a something that seems at first original but only suited to women of adventurous life so this education and the consequent asperities of character which would have been softened down in a higher social sphere could only serve to make her ridiculous at angouleme so soon as her adorers should cease to worship eccentricities that charm only in youth as for monsieur de negropolis he would have given all his daughter's books to save the life of a sick bullock and so miserly was he that he would not have given her two farthings over and above the allowance to which she had a right even if it had been a question of some indispensable trifle for her education in eighteen hundred and two the abbe died before the marriage of his dear child a marriage which he doubtless would never have advised the old father found his daughter a great care now that the abbe was gone the high-spirited girl with nothing else to do was sure to break into rebellion against his niggardliness and he felt quite unequal to the struggle like all young women who leave the appointed track of woman's life nais had her own opinions about marriage and had no great inclination thereto she shrank from submitting herself body and soul to the feeble undignified specimens of mankind whom she had chanced to meet she wished to rule marriage meant obedience and between obedience to coarse caprices and a mind without indulgence for her tastes and flight with a lover who should please her she would not have hesitated for a moment m de negropolis maintained sufficient of the tradition of birth to dread a mesalliance like many another parent he resolved to marry his daughter not so much on her account as for his own peace of mind a noble or a country gentleman was the man for him somebody not too clever incapable of haggling over the account of the trust stupid enough and easy enough to allow nais to have her own way and disinterested enough to take her without a dowry but where to look for a son-in-law to suit father and daughter equally well was the problem such a man would be the phoenix of sons-in-law to m de negropolice pondering over the eligible bachelors of the province with these double requirements in his mind 
monsieur de bargeton seemed to be the only one who answered to this description monsieur de bargeton aged forty considerably shattered by the amorous dissipations of his youth was generally held to be a man of remarkably feeble intellect but he had just the exact amount of common sense required for the management of his fortune and breeding sufficient to enable him to avoid blunders or blatant follies in society in angouleme in the bluntest manner m de negropolis pointed out the negative virtues of the model husband designed for his daughter and made her see the way to manage him so as to secure her own happiness so nais married the bearer of arms two hundred years old already for the bargeton arms are blazoned thus the first or three attires ghouls the second three oxes heads cabossed two and one sable the third bari of six azure and argent in the first six shells or three two and one provided with a chaperon nais could steer her fortunes as she chose under the style of the firm and with the help of such connections as her wit and beauty would obtain for her in paris nais was enchanted by the prospect of such liberty m de bargeton was of the opinion that he was making a brilliant marriage for he expected that in no long while m de negropolis would leave him the estates which he was rounding out so lovingly but to an unprejudiced spectator it certainly seemed as though the duty of writing the bridegroom's epitaph might devolve upon his father-in-law by this time madame de bargeton was thirty-six years old and her husband fifty-eight the disparity in age was the more startling since m de bargeton looked like a man of seventy whereas his wife looked scarcely half her age she could still wear rose color and her hair hanging loose upon her shoulders although their income did not exceed twelve thousand francs they ranked among the half-dozen largest fortunes in the old city merchants and officials excepted for monsieur and madame de bargeton were obliged to live in angouleme until such time as madame de bargeton's inheritance should fall in and they could go to paris meanwhile they were bound to be attentive to old m de negropolice who kept them waiting so long that his son-in-law in fact predeceased him and nais's brilliant intellectual gifts and the wealth that lay like undiscovered ore in her nature profited her nothing underwent the transforming operation of time and changed to absurdities for our absurdities spring in fact for the most part from the good in us from some faculty or quality abnormally developed pride untempered by intercourse with the great world becomes stiff and starched by contact with petty things in a loftier moral atmosphere it would have grown to noble magnanimity enthusiasm that virtue within a virtue forming the saint inspiring the devotion hidden from all eyes and glowing out upon the world in verse turns to exaggeration with the trifles of a narrow existence for its object far away from the centres of light shed by great minds where the air is quick with thought knowledge stands still taste is corrupted like stagnant water and passion dwindles frittered away upon the infinitely small objects which it strives to exalt herein lies the secret of the avarice and tittle-tattle that poison provincial life the contagion of narrow-mindedness and meanness affects the noblest natures and in such ways as these men born to be great and women who would have been charming if they had fallen under the forming influence of greater minds are balked of their lives here was madame de bargeton for instance smiting the lyre for every trifle and publishing her emotions indiscriminately to her circle as a matter of fact when sensations appeal to an audience of one it is better to keep them to ourselves a sunset certainly is a glorious poem but if a woman describes it in high-sounding words for the benefit of matter-of-fact people is she not ridiculous 
there are pleasures which can only be felt to the full when two souls meet poet and poet heart and heart she had a trick of using high-sounding phrases interlarded with exaggerated expressions the kind of stuff ingeniously nicknamed tartines by the french journalist who furnishes a daily supply of the commodity for a public that daily performs the difficult feat of swallowing it she squandered superlatives recklessly in her talk and the smallest things took giant proportions it was at this period of her career that she began to typeize individualize synthesize dramatize superiorize analyze poetize angelize neologize tragedify prosify and colossify you must violate the laws of language to find words to express the new fangled whimsies in which even women here and there indulge the heat of her language communicated itself to the brain and the dithyrambs on her lips were spoken out of the abundance of her heart she palpitated swooned and went into ecstasies over anything and everything over the devotion of a sister of charity and the execution of the brothers fauché over m d'arlincourt's ipsiboe louis's anaconda or the escape of la valette or the presence of mind of a lady friend who put burglars to flight by imitating a man's voice everything was heroic extraordinary strange wonderful and divine she would work herself into a state of excitement indignation or depression she soared to heaven and sank again gazed at the sky or looked to earth her eyes were always filled with tears she wore herself out with chronic admiration and wasted her strength on curious dislikes her mind ran on the pasha of janina she would have liked to try conclusions with him in his seraglio and had a great notion of being sewn in a sack and thrown into the water she envied that blue stocking of the desert lady hester stanhope she longed to be a sister of saint camilla and tend the sick and die of yellow fever in a hospital at barcelona twas a high and noble destiny in short she thirsted for any draught but the clear spring water of her own life flowing hidden among green pastures she adored byron and jean jacques rousseau or anybody else with a picturesque or dramatic career her tears were ready to flow for every misfortune she sang paeans for every victory she sympathized with the fallen napoleon and with mehemet ali massacring the foreign usurpers of egypt in short any kind of genius was accommodated with an aureole and she was fully persuaded that gifted immortals lived on incense and light a good many people looked upon her as a harmless lunatic but in these extravagances of hers a keener observer surely would have seen the broken fragments of a magnificent edifice that had crumbled into ruin before it was completed the stones of a heavenly jerusalem love in short without a lover and this was indeed the fact the story of the first eighteen years of madame de bargeton's married life can be summed up in a few words for a long while she lived upon herself and distant hopes then when she began to see that their narrow income put the longed-for life in paris quite out of the question she looked about her at the people with whom her life must be spent and shuddered at her loneliness there was not a single man who could inspire the madness to which women are prone when they despair of a life become stale and unprofitable in the present and with no outlook for the future she had nothing to look for nothing to expect from chance for there are lives in which chance plays no part but when the empire was in the full noonday of glory and napoleon was sending the flower of his troops to the peninsula her disappointed hopes revived natural curiosity prompted her to make an effort to see the heroes who were conquering europe in obedience to a word from the emperor in the order of the day the heroes of a modern time who outdid the mythical feats of paladins of old 
the cities of france however avaricious or refractory must perforce do honor to the imperial guard and mayors and prefects went out to meet them with set speeches as if the conquerors had been crowned kings madame de bargeton went to a ridotto given to the town by a regiment and fell in love with an officer of a good family a sub-lieutenant to whom the crafty napoleon had given a glimpse of the baton of a marshal of france love restrained greater and nobler than the ties that were made and unmade so easily in those days was consecrated coldly by the hands of death on the battlefield of wagram a shell shattered the only record of madame de bargeton's young beauty a portrait worn on the heart of the marquis of cantecroix for long afterwards she wept for the young soldier the colonel in his second campaign for the heart hot with love and glory that set a letter from nais above imperial favor the pain of those days cast a veil of sadness over her face a shadow that only vanished at the terrible age when a woman first discovers with dismay that the best years of her life are over and she has had no joy of them when she sees her roses wither and the longing for love is revived again with the desire to linger yet for a little on the last smiles of youth her nobler qualities dealt so many wounds to her soul at the moment when the cold of the provinces seized upon her she would have died of grief like the ermine if by chance she had been sullied by contact with those men whose thoughts are bent on winning a few sous nightly at cards after a good dinner pride saved her from the shabby love intrigues of the provinces a woman so much above the level of those about her forced to decide between the emptiness of the men whom she meets and the emptiness of her own life can make but one choice marriage and society became a cloister for anais she lived by poetry as the carmelite lives by religion all the famous foreign books published in france for the first time between eighteen fifteen and eighteen twenty one the great essayists m de bonal and m de mestre those two eagles of thought all the lighter french literature in short that appeared during that sudden outburst of first vigorous growth might bring delight into her solitary life but not flexibility of mind or body she stood strong and straight like some forest tree lightning blasted but still erect her dignity became a stilted manner her social supremacy led her into affectation and sentimental over-refinements she queened it with her foibles after the usual fashion of those who allow their courtiers to adore them this was madame de bargeton's past life a dreary chronicle which must be given if lucien's position with regard to the lady is to be comprehensible lucien's introduction came about oddly enough in the previous winter a newcomer had brought some interest into madame de bargeton's monotonous life the place of controller of excise fell vacant and m de barante appointed a man whose adventurous life was a sufficient passport to the house of the sovereign lady who had her share of feminine curiosity m du chatelet he began life as plain sixth chatelet but since eighteen hundred and six had the wit to adopt the particle m du chatelet was one of the agreeable young men who escaped conscription after conscription by keeping very close to the imperial son he had begun his career as private secretary to an imperial highness a post for which he possessed every qualification personable and of a good figure a clever billiard player a passable amateur actor he danced well and excelled in most physical exercises he could moreover sing a ballad and applaud a witticism supple envious never at a loss there was nothing that he did not know nothing that he really knew 
he knew nothing for instance of music but he could sit down to the piano and accompany after a fashion a woman who consented after much pressing to sing a ballad learned by heart in a month of hard practice incapable though he was of any feeling for poetry he would boldly ask permission to retire for ten minutes to compose an impromptu and return with a quatrain flat as a pancake wherein rhyme did duty for reason m du chatelet had besides a very pretty talent for filling in the ground of the princess's worsted work after the flowers had been begun he held her skeins of silk with infinite grace entertained her with dubious nothings more or less transparently veiled he was ignorant of painting but he could copy a landscape sketch a head in profile or design a costume and color it he had in short all the little talents that a man could turn to such useful account in times when women exercised more influence in public life than most people imagine diplomacy he claimed to be his strong point it usually is with those who have no knowledge and are profound by reason of their emptiness and indeed this kind of skill possesses one signal advantage for it can only be displayed in the conduct of the affairs of the great and when discretion is the quality required a man who knows nothing can safely say nothing and take refuge in a mysterious shake of the head in fact the cleverest practitioner is he who can swim with the current and keep his head well above the stream of events which he appears to control a man's fitness for this business varying inversely as his specific gravity but in this particular art or craft as in all others you shall find a thousand mediocrities for one man of genius and in spite of chatelet's services ordinary and extraordinary her imperial highness could not procure a seat in the privy council for her private secretary not that he would not have made a delightful master of requests like many another but the princess was of the opinion that her secretary was better placed with her than anywhere else in the world he was made a baron however and went to cassel as envoy extraordinary no empty form of words for he cut a very extraordinary figure there napoleon used him as a diplomatic courier in the thick of a european crisis just as he had been promised the post of minister to jerome in westphalia the empire fell to pieces and balked of his ambassade de famille as he called it he went off in despair to egypt with general de montriveau a strange chapter of accidents separated him from his travelling companion and for two long years sixte du chatelet led a wandering life among the arab tribes of the desert who sold and resold their captive his talents being not of the slightest use to the nomad tribes at length about the time that montriveau reached tangier chatelet found himself in the territory of the imam of muscat had the luck to find an english vessel just about to set sail and so came back to paris a year sooner than his sometime companion once in paris his recent misfortunes and certain connections of long standing together with services rendered to great persons now in power recommended him to the president of the council who put him in monsieur de baron's department until such time as a controllership should fall vacant so the part that m du chatelet had once played in the history of the imperial princess his reputation for success with women the strange story of his travels and sufferings all awakened the interest of the ladies of angouleme m le baron sixte du chatelet informed himself as to the manners and customs of the upper town and took his cue accordingly he appeared on the scene as a jaded man of the world broken in health and weary in spirit he would raise his hand to his forehead at all seasons as if pain never gave him a moment's respite a habit that recalled his travels and made him interesting 
he was on visiting terms with the authorities the general in command the prefect the receiver-general and the bishop but in every house he was frigid polite and slightly supercilious like a man out of his proper place awaiting the favors of power his social talents he left to conjecture nor did they lose anything in reputation on that account then when people began to talk about him and wished to know him and curiosity was still lively when he had reconnoitred the men and found them not and studied the women with the eyes of experience in the cathedral for several sundays he saw that madame de bargeton was the person with whom it would be best to be on intimate terms music he thought should open the doors of a house where strangers were never received surreptitiously he procured one of miroir's masses learned it upon the piano and one fine sunday when all angouleme went to the cathedral he played the organ sent those who knew no better into ecstasies over the performance and stimulated the interest felt in him by allowing his name to slip out through the attendance as he came out after mass madame de bargeton complimented him regretting that she had no opportunity of playing duets with such a musician and naturally during an interview of her own seeking he received the passport which he could not have obtained if he had asked for it so the adroit baron was admitted to the circle of the queen of angouleme and paid her marked attention the elderly beau he was forty-five years old saw that all her youth lay dormant and ready to revive saw treasures to be turned to account and possibly a rich widow to wed to say nothing of expectations it would be a marriage into the family of negro police and for him this meant a family connection with the marquise d'espard and a political career in paris here was a fair tree to cultivate in spite of the ill-omened unsightly mistletoe that grew thick upon it he would hang his fortunes upon it and prune it and wait till he could gather its golden fruit high-born angouleme shrieked against the introduction of a jower into the sanctuary for madame de bargeton's salon was a kind of holy of holies in a society that kept itself unspotted from the world the only outsider intimate there was the bishop the prefect was admitted twice or thrice in a year the receiver-general was never received at all madame de bargeton would go to concerts and at homes at his house but she never accepted invitations to dinner and now she who had declined to open her doors to the receiver-general welcomed a mere controller of excise here was a novel order of precedence for snubbed authority such a thing it had never entered their minds to conceive those who by dint of mental effort can understand a kind of pettiness which for that matter can be found on any and every social level will realize the awe with which the bourgeoisie of angouleme regarded the hotel de bargeton the inhabitant of l'houmeau beheld the grandeur of that miniature louvre the glory of the angoumoisin hotel de rambouillet shining at a solar distance and yet within it there was gathered together all the direst intellectual poverty all the decayed gentility from twenty leagues round about political opinion expanded itself in wordy commonplaces vociferated with emphasis the quotidienne was comparatively laodicean in its loyalty and louis the eighteenth a jacobin the women for the most part were awkward silly insipid and ill-dressed there was always something amiss that spoiled the whole nothing in them was complete toilette or talk flesh or spirit but for his designs on madame de bargeton chatelet could not have endured the society and yet the manners and spirit of the noble in his ruined manor-house the knowledge of the traditions of good breeding these things covered a multitude of deficiencies nobility of feeling 
was far more real here than in the lofty world of paris you might compare these country royalists if the metaphor may be allowed to old-fashioned silver plate antiquated and tarnished but weighty their attachment to the house of bourbon as the house of bourbon did them honor the very fixity of their political opinions was a sort of faithfulness the distance that they set between themselves and the bourgeoisie their very exclusiveness gave them a certain elevation and enhanced their value each noble represented a certain price for the townsmen as bambara negroes we are told attach a money value to cowrie shells some of the women flattered by m du chatelet discerned in him the superior qualities lacking in the men of their own sect and the insurrection of self-love was pacified these ladies all hoped to succeed to the imperial highness purists were of the opinion that you might see the intruder in madame de bargeton's house but not elsewhere du chatelet was fain to put up with a good deal of insolence but he held his ground by cultivating the clergy he encouraged the queen of angouleme in foibles bred of the soil he brought her all the newest books he read aloud the poetry that appeared together they went into ecstasies over these poets she in all sincerity he with suppressed yawns but he bore with the romantics with a patience hardly to be expected of a man of the imperial school who scarcely could make out what the young writers meant not so madame de bargeton she waxed enthusiastic over the renaissance due to the return of the bourbon lilies she loved m de chateaubriand for calling victor hugo a sublime child it depressed her that she could only know genius from afar she sighed for paris where great men live for these reasons m du chatelet thought he had done a wonderfully clever thing when he told the lady that at that moment in angouleme there was another sublime child a young poet a rising star whose glory surpassed the whole parisian galaxy though he knew it not a great man of the future had been born in l'houmeau the headmaster of the school had shown the baron some admirable verses the poor and humble lad was a second chatterton with none of the political baseness and ferocious hatred of the great ones of earth that led his english prototype to turn pamphleteer and revile his benefactors madame de bargeton in her little circle of five or six persons who were supposed to share her tastes for art and letters because this one scraped a fiddle and that splashed sheets of white paper more or less with sepia and the other was president of a local agricultural society or was gifted with a bass voice that rendered se fiato in corpo like a war-whoop madame de bargeton amid these grotesque figures was like a famished actor set down to a stage dinner of pasteboard no words therefore can describe her joy at these tidings she must see this poet this angel she raved about him went into raptures talked of him for whole hours together before two days were out the sometime diplomatic courier had negotiated through the headmaster for lucien's appearance in the hotel de bargeton chapter four